Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. The topic for the day is going to be diversity and trophic structures. Just one short objective, so let me get you that, and we'll get going. By the end of this video, one thing for you to know or be able to do, and that is to discuss the major factors at work in the dynamics of an ecosystem. I know that's general because the topics we're going to talk about today are kind of diverse, but they all are loosely wrapped around the idea of trophic structure and basic ecosystem structure. So we're going to jump in and kind of jump through those. Hopefully they'll understand ecosystems a bit better when we're done. So first thing to start out with is the idea of diversity. And with this idea of diversity, you've got species richness and species evenness. When ecologists describe an ecosystem, they talk about two different factors. One of them is the species richness, which is basically talking about how many species are in that uh, ecosystem. doesn't matter if there's one representative of the species, it still counts as a new species in that ecosystem. If we're talking about species evenness, we're talking about what proportion of each species is represented in a um, I guess an ecosystem. So if I were to draw you out a quick example, you may you might have species A, B, C, and D all represented in an ecosystem. Um, ecosystem one, let's say, has got three members A, three members B, three members C, three members D. So this ecosystem right here shows species richness in that you've got four different species. It also shows species evenness in that you've got three representatives of each species. Now, if we come down here to ecosystem two, you might have, I don't know, let's say nine representatives of A, one B, one C, and one D. Now you have still got the same number of individuals, but if you were to walk into that ecosystem, you would probably only see individual A and not so much B, C, or D. So the richness of these two ecosystems is the same, but the evenness is not. And there are equations to work out which species is more diverse, or which uh, ecosystem is more diverse than the other. Basically, it's gonna say that since one species is so overrepresented in ecosystem two, ecosystem one is actually the more diverse of the ecosystems. And this idea of diversity ties into stability. And basic, the basic idea is that um, biodiversity in an ecosystem lends stability to that ecosystem. And that's kind of intuitive if you think about it. So, I don't know, let's go with the example of plants. Let's say that in a species or in an area, you've only got one species of plant. If a fungus comes through that kills off that plant, it's going to kill off all of the plants in the ecosystem. However, if you've got an ecosystem that has like 30 species of plants, that fungus is going to kill off the one species it's particular to, but then there's going to be 29 species remaining that's going to keep the ecosystem healthy. Several studies have shown that the more diverse an ecosystem is, the more productive it is, um, obviously the higher its biodiversity. Also, diverse ecosystems are more resistant to uh, invasive, specie, invasive species, and there's several hypotheses about that. One is that the biodiversity takes away resources that an invasive species might be able to use. It also um, provides a greater opportunity that there's some sort of predator in that ecosystem that will keep the invasive species out. So diversity leads to stability in ecosystems. And when we're talking about ecosystems, we also need to talk about the trophic structure, which is basically the feeding relationships within a uh, ecosystem. Now we're gonna talk about numbers in another video, but just want to get the basic idea of a chain versus a web in your brain. So if we are talking about a food chain, and this is something you probably remember from all of your basic biology classes, a food chain just starts like this. You get your primary producer at the bottom, species A, which is eaten by a primary consumer, which is species B, eaten by a secondary consumer, which is C, and so on in a very linear fashion where energy is flowing up the chain in this direction. So energy made in the producer level is passed off to species B, which passes it off to species C. A food web recognizes a much greater reality. In the real world, 
you don't have nice clean chains like this. You have got everybody connected to everybody else. So in this ecosystem here, you've got like polar bears, which might eat fish and the fish might eat amphipods, but they are also eaten by ducks and the ducks might be eaten by some sort of predatory bird or seal. And you have got the, let's see who else we got over here. We've got kittiwakes, which feed on some of the animals down in this direction. So it recognizes that I don't know. Nature isn't a clean, neat, linear flow, that there are multiple relationships. So just recognize a chain, flow of energy, very linear. A web uh, is a real-time representation of all of the feeding relationships that exist in an ecosystem. And there are natural limits to the size of a trophic pyramid. And this is something that scientists have done a lot of work around to figure out, you know, how long can a food chain go? And they've kind of found that in the most productive ecosystems, the longest a food chain can go is roughly seven organisms. Usually they don't go longer than that. Average food chain is about five organisms. And there's been essentially two hypotheses that have been put forward to explain why food chains are relatively short. First one is the energetic hypothesis, and this works on the basic idea that only about 10% of the energy from one trophic level is actually able to be passed to the next level. So what this means, practically speaking, is let's say down here at the bottom you've got your producers, and your producers represent 100 grams of biomass. Biomass is all the living material. Because they actually um, need some of that biomass to survive, only about 10% gets passed on to the next level, and from this, only 10% is able to get passed on to the last level. So because of the inefficiency of bodily processes or organismal metabolic processes, a lot of energy is lost to heat, very little is actually able to be pushed onto the next level. So that would be the energetic hypothesis. And there's dynamic stability hypothesis, which basically just says that Food chains are in equilibrium with one another, and changes in that food chain are going to ripple throughout the whole food chain, keeping it at a pretty consistent and stable size. So not much numerical work that goes with that hypothesis. It just goes with observations saying that, hey, um, populations fluctuate in relation to one another, and that might pose a limit to the length of a food web. We're starting to kind of move on towards the end of our tutorial for the day. Um, I want to talk about key players in ecosystems, three different types of species. you got a dominant species. Dominant species are the species that are generally most abundant in an ecosystem. So it could be a type of primary producer, it could be an uh, insect, it could be a microbe. Whatever the most dominant species is, that is the dominant species in an area. And they exert influence on the uh, ecosystem just in that they are the most abundant species. So that so they're going to have the largest impact. Then there are keystone species. Keystone species may not be the dominant species in an area, may not be the most important, but relative to their abundance, they have got a huge impact on the ecosystem. And what I mean by this, or I guess the best way I could explain this is through an example. Um, sea otters are one of the few organisms that are able to eat those little critters on the side, sea urchins. Sea urchins are predators on kelp, which is a big seaweed that grows in the ocean. So when sea otters are around, sea urchin numbers are low, and kelp forests grow big, huge, and they're really productive ecosystems full of fish and turtles and sharks and everything else. If sea otters are taken out of the area, so let's say like back in the 1800s, sea otters were hunted near extinction. Sea otters went away because the sea otters were gone, the proportion of the sea urchins or the sea urchin population increased dramatically. Because the sea urchin population increased dramatically, they ate all of the kelp, which means the kelp forest went away and all of the animals associated with the kelp forest also went away. So by removing that one species, the sea otter, you had a huge impact on the whole ecosystem. And the last species in an ecosystem I want to talk about is an engineer species, which are species that actually alter the landscape of an ecosystem. So examples of these would be uh, beavers. They build beaver dams. They cut down trees, things like that. Um, elephants are known to push over trees and make paths through forests. So those would be examples of engineer species. And this is the last slide for the day. Um, scientists talk about how, I guess, ecosystems are controlled, and they put out two essential hypotheses on this, a bottom-up control or a top-down control. 
A bottom-up control theory basically says that the producers down on the bottom, the abundance of producers down here on the bottom, control how many organisms are uh, present in the rest of the chain. So basically it says that if you've got a lot of primary producers, then you are going to have a lot of primary consumers and a lot of secondary consumers and a lot of tertiary consumers. But if you push down the number of primary producers, then the abundance of all of these are going to go down as well. Another, or I guess, another, yeah, another hypothesis would be the top-down control, which basically says that everything is reliant on the trophic level above it. So this would be saying that if you were to increase your proportion of top predators, that would decrease the proportion of the level under them. And if you decrease this level, then the next level down actually goes up because these guys are eating more of these guys, so they're going to go down. But since there's fewer of these eating those, they're going to go up. And since they go up, they're going to eat more of the primary producers, which is going to go down. So this kind of got like a back and forth positive negative effect. So just two different ways of looking at the way that ecosystems are controlled um, through trophic structure. And that's it. I know there's a lot of kind of disconnected topics, but I hope they give you a little better insight into some of the structures present in an ecosystem. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.